I'm delighted to uh, introduce you our first keynote speaker, Wenxin Du. And uh, Wenxin is an example of what we really cherish at this conference. Her work is not only academically outstanding, but highly relevant for central bankers and market practitioners. So we are very happy to have you. Um, Wang Xin worked, um, or after earning her PhD at Harvard University, Wang Xin worked as economist for the US Fed Board before becoming a professor of finance at Chicago Booth School of Business and most recently, professor of finance at Columbia Business School. Wang Xin, the floor is yours. Great. Well, okay, great. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a true honor to be here. Uh, today, as you'll see, the title of the talk is Repo and FX Swap, A Tale of Two Markets. Um, in the first three talks, we've already mentioned a lot about the repo market, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll appreciate this other market a lot more. Um, so uh, in this talk, the central theme is that the repo and FX swaps are the two most important short-term funding markets uh, for the US dollar liquidity. As I will show, the two markets share very uh, many similarities, but also are distinct along several important dimensions. A very important commonality between the two markets is that the dealers and banks play a central role in both markets. And in particular, the time varying intermediary constraint um, in part of the post-crisis regulation is the key driver of the pricing in both markets. A big part of this talk is also uh, to use this opportunity to demystify the FX swap markets. And we're going to, for the second time today, make use of the MMSR, the Money Market Statistical Reporting transaction data collected here at the ECB. And uh, a central message is that despite the breakdown of a fundamental no arbitrage condition in FX swap called cover interest reparity, so if we think cover interest reparity doesn't work, the market isn't functional, we want to really highlight the contrary. The FX swap market is overall a very well-functioning market, and it serves a very important function of fulfill significant dollar demand during stress days, particularly reaching out to market participants who do not have ready access uh, to the cash market funding alternative. Okay, so the structure of the talk has three parts. The first part, I'll give you an overview of the structure of the two markets, talk about the cash flow market structure and the balance sheet implications. The second part is I'll discuss more on the pricing side in terms of linkages between the two markets. I'll comment on the funding cost comparison on average and also in the cross section. And I'll also uh, specifically focus on the quarter end dynamics where lots of interesting things happen in money markets. And finally, uh, I'll use a few minutes to discuss implications for uh, financial stability policies and also perhaps I'll open that up uh, for Q&A. Okay. So first, let's start with the overview of the two markets. Uh, this is the single most basic cash flow diagram uh, for short-term funding markets. Um, to give an example of JP Morgan as the dollar lender in the US dollar repo market, and we have some USD borrower. It doesn't have to be a US uh, person, can be somewhere outside the US. Um, the transaction flow is at time T, JP Morgan is going to give dollar cash to the USD borrower. Um, in terms of a repo loan, so it's a reverse repo uh, on the book of JP Morgan, and the USD borrower pledges the US Treasury as collateral. At T plus one, all the cash flow reverses, uh, we have the USD borrower returns the dollar cash, and JP Morgan returns the collateral. So how does the FX swap market actually compare to the repo transaction? In fact, very similarly, all you need to do is replace the collateral. Uh, instead of using the US Treasury bond, but use a foreign currency instead. Uh, so here, since we're at the ECB, I'm using this example of JP Morgan lending dollars in the Euro dollar swap markets, and the USD lender is going to essentially exchange the dollar borrowing for Euro at the inception of the trade. So Euro can be viewed as the collateral for the dollar lending. Um, and in this case, the spot exchange rate is used at time T, T plus T to exchange between dollar and Euro, so it's happening at the market rate. And at T plus one, the USD borrower is going to give back US dollar and the JP Morgan is going, back, going to give back the Euro. It is very important to note that the FX swap does not involve any FX risk because 
the exchange rate at t plus one is preset at time t. So the exchange rate between dollar and euro is going to happen at an outright uh, forward rate uh, that is predetermined and pre-agreed upon between the two counterparties. So um, in short, uh, as you can see, FX swap is a very powerful funding instrument in addition to a currency hedging instrument because in this case, the USD borrower achieves the same goal of getting US dollar, and the banks also fulfills the mission of lending the dollar securely. In this case, not collateralized by US Treasury, but collateralized by a euro, uh, a foreign currency. And with initial and variation margins, it's just as secure as a typical repo transaction. Okay, so um, in terms of the overall market structure, uh, both markets share a lot of commonality. In particular, uh, the global dollar funding market is highly segmented. In a sense, we have a lot of cash-rich dollar lenders who do not direct, have direct access uh, to people who want to borrow dollars. Um, so in this chart, I'm just giving you some example. On the left, we have some cash-rich lenders in the USD markets, such as the money market funds, the prime funds, or the government funds. And towards the end of this chart, uh, in the orange box, we have the ultimate dollar borrowers, such as banks, hedge funds, institutional investors, and corporates. Um, it is important to note, because of the strict mandates of US money market funds, they are not allowed to essentially lend to anyone. They can only lend uh, to the US government, or they can lend to banks uh, with very high ratings, uh, subject to a very strict diversification limits. Um, so not everybody in the orange box is going to be able to borrow from the cash-rich money market funds. So this motivates a significant need to have large amount of intermediation, which are these entities sitting in the green box. So these are the large global banking organizations. They don't have to be US banks. In fact, non-US banks play just as important role in intermediating dollar funding in the global markets, um, in addition to the banks, uh, international banks, obviously the affiliated uh, repo and FX swap dealers are also facilitating uh, the plumbing of the global dollar system. Um, so in terms of repo and FX swaps, uh, we think about the repo markets, um, typically tend to be a bit shorter dated. Uh, the overnight is still the most uh, common tenor. And in terms of the size, uh, we're talking about $3 trillion in the US uh, private repo market. Uh, in recent years, because of the large expansion and take up in the uh, Fed overnight reverse repo facility, there is essentially additional one or two uh, three billion, uh, sorry, one or two trillion dollar uh, between uh, the money market funds and the Federal Reserve. Okay, that is not part of the three trillion dollars. So as most people in this room thought, okay, repo is perhaps the largest short-term funding market. Uh, in fact, there is a larger one, and that is the FX swap. Um, so the tenor also tend to be a little short term, uh, except maybe not as short term. I mean, you, you can have overnight and spot next and tomorrow next FX swaps, but uh, a large part of the liquidity is also centered around a few term dates, like a week, a month, for instance. And the size in terms of the USD linked contract uh, is currently outstanding at close to $100 trillion. Um, so significantly higher in terms of the total size when compared to the repo market. Um, so now let's talk about the balance sheet implications between these two types of activities. Uh, on this slide, uh, the title of the figure is total activities. Uh, so it's not, I mean, as I'll shortly explain, it's not everything is on balance sheet. When it comes to the repo, uh, you think about uh, the bank's lending repo in the jargon, that's reverse repo position from a bank perspective. Think about this as the JP Morgan's balance sheets. And on the liability side, JP Morgan may borrow uh, in order to lend, also in the repo market. And there could be some additional uh, source of unbalance sheet funding that JP Morgan is going to be able to source to make up the difference between the repo lending and the repo borrowing, and therefore uh, end up with a net repo lending position. Okay. Very similarly for FX swaps, again, JP Morgan could lend dollars in the FX swap markets, and in the meanwhile, it can borrow dollars in the FX swap markets. And if there's a deficit between the overall gross lending and the gross borrowing, uh, they need to source some additional uh, cash market funding in order to support that. Okay, so the mechanics is very similar. Large, gro large dealers uh, have large gross positions on borrowing and lending sites in both markets. However, there is a key difference. The key difference is, at least in the US dollar markets, the gross repo uh, borrowing and lending positions cannot be netted out, whereas the gross uh, borrowing and lending position for FX swap, because they are derivatives, largely off balance sheet except for the margins, can be netted. 
So if we change the title of the figure to on balance sheet activities, you see a significant difference here. Um, you see in the most majority of the case where the repo transactions cannot be netted out, uh, the repo is a lot more balance sheet intensive when it comes to just think about the total size of the balance sheet usage. However, if you're doing match book FX swaps, the gross borrowing and lending FX swaps can be netted. Uh, however, if there's a net deficit, if you want to be a net lender or a net borrower in the FX swap markets, and that is supported by additional unbalanced sheet lending or borrowing, and that net lending part uh, cannot be netted out and therefore stays on balance sheet, okay? So that's a very important distinction. It's very useful to keep this in mind when we talk about the quarter and dynamics later. Okay, so uh, in addition to the usual balance sheet implications, thinking, uh, speaking of the Basel's free and non-risk weighted leverage ratio, basically it's the total size of balance sheet that matters the most. We just discussed the difference. When it comes to the other type of important uh, regulations and regulatory metrics, uh, I'll just highlight very briefly, like both types of activities are virtually pretty much risk-free, so they involve very, very little risk-based capital charge. Um, so uh, in addition to the implication for the leverage ratio, depending on whether you're doing gross versus net, which market you're operating on, there is also additional consideration, and that is the GSIP, which stands for Global Systematic Important Banks, uh, capital surcharge uh, that has different dimensions. Uh, banks have to score on different dimensions, and in particular, the FX swap activities uh, tick more box uh, for GSIP surcharge. And in many jurisdictions, the GSIP surcharge is assessed based on the year and snapshot of bank balance sheets. And therefore, on year ends, the FX swap markets, generally speaking, are more on the distress uh, because uh, the activities tick more GSIP surcharge boxes. All right, so that was the background to set up the stage for us to understand the mechanics of these two markets. Now it comes to sort of the meat of the talk and talk about the pricing of the two markets and the connections between the two markets. Um, so let's start with the repo first. Um, so we know in the US, uh, we have completed the transition to a new benchmark rate, and that is SOFR, which stands for Secured Overnight Financing Rate. And uh, to many of us, it's just like one rate, but in practice, there, there are many repo rates, right? I mean, I guess the first talk talk about uh, the euro area collateral scarcity, but even in the absence of uh, specialness of different QSIPs in the repo markets, even in terms of general collateral borrowing, uh, repo rate can be different across different market participant types. So this first slide is strictly taken from a summer statistics uh, from the Federal Reserve Banks of New York's uh, SOFR publication, where we have uh, reported uh, the average SOFR rate uh, between 2016 uh, to the present at around 177 basis points. Um, and uh, it gives you the distribution of all the individual rates that go into the SOFR, which is the volume, weight, volume weighted medium rates of all the individual repo transactions. Um, so it is important to note uh, that all these individual transactions could include uh, some special repo. So, so usually I wouldn't uh, take uh, the first percentile to indicate the GC repo rate, but once you go to the 25th percentile, uh, it is still generally um, reflecting the demand for cash as opposed to the specific demand for collateral, okay? So what you see here is that the SOFR rate at 177, okay? And what is this rate? This is the tri-party repo rate. Uh, this is the specific segments of the repo market that goes into the SOFR that reflects specifically the borrowing between uh, the, the borrowing um, from money market funds uh, from the large bank dealer's perspective, okay? So this is thinking about our diagram. This is the top leg of the chart where uh, money market funds lend to sort of the top tier global banks and top tier global banks enjoy the privilege of borrow from money market funds at a very low rate, okay? So tri-party rate at 175 basis points, but so far uh, generally lines up decently with the tri-party rate. So you think about this as the large bank's funding rate in the repo market. Uh, they're doing the business, it's very balance sheet intensive. Uh, they have to turn around that dollar at a higher rate, right? How much can they earn? Uh, so if you go to the 75th percentile, they earn on average, not handsome amount, like three basis points, but if you go to the 99th percentile, um, they can earn up to 15 basis points on average doing a matchbook repo intermediation, borrowing from money market funds, and then turn around, lend to someone like a small bank dealers or hedge funds uh, at 190 basis points, capturing the 15 basis point spreads, okay? So that's the mechanics of the repo market when it comes to the price dispersion. How about the FX swap markets? Um, 
generally speaking, it is more expensive to borrow in the FX swap market uh, for US dollar funding because we have a deviation from cover interest parity condition. Uh, what CIP is, uh, is that post-crisis, uh, the implied dollar funding rate from the FX swap, the first term on this equation highlighted in blue, is going to be generally greater uh, than the cash market dollar funding cost measured in repo or OIS uh, or LIBOR, okay? And uh, for the euro dollar swap market at least. Um, so, but how exactly, how much is this exactly? Like we know in the repo markets, going from the lowest rate to the highest rate is about 15 basis points. But when it comes to the FX swap, um, so in the ongoing work uh, with George Strasser here at the ECB and Adrian Verdahan at MIT, we make use of the euro dollar FX swap transaction from the MMSR data, where for each transaction, we observe the actual price. Uh, so this is not Bloomberg quoted price, this is actual price. Uh, so over the three year sample between 2018 to 2021, uh, we get around 30 basis points. Uh, doesn't matter whether the MMSR banks are borrowing or lending on average, like it doesn't matter if you're borrowing or lending on average, uh, the funding rates uh, implied from these actual transactions are about 30 basis points higher than the US dollar repo rate, okay? So this means uh, the FX swap markets always operate at a, at a higher rate uh, compared to even the most, um, I guess the, the highest segments of the repo rates. Uh, so there is a hierarchy uh, going on. So despite the dispersion, but the segments overall is, is more expensive. And uh, this already uh, rings the bells. It's like something's more expensive, sounds like it's not operating as efficiently. And uh, without doing this analysis, when I first go to Bloomberg and want to calculate uh, some FX uh, implied funding rates here in the plotted in the form of CIP deviations uh, for the tomorrow next tenor, I see a lot of big, big spikes. And uh, so I started with the Bloomberg quote, which is in blue. I was like, okay, there's so many spikes. It looks like this market again has some issues. Uh, how come you have so much volatility? But what's amazing is that when you compare to the actual transaction, which is plotted in red, you can barely see the difference. So the quoted big spikes uh, from Bloomberg's are actually coinciding very closely with the actual transaction price. So price are high for a good reason. There's actually transaction taking place at this high price, okay? And another way to look at uh, whether the FX swap market is functioning or not is to look at within uh, a certain trading day, looking at the uh, uh, price dispersion across different um, market participants. So we discussed in the repo market that dispersion is around 15 basis points. And for the FX swap markets, uh, the nice thing about the MMSR data, it also gives you all the granularity of the counterparty types. Uh, so this shows uh, when the MMSR banks are borrowing uh, dollars from the tomorrow next um, segments of the market, uh, against uh, from all these uh, different market participants. As you can see, when the MMSR banks, these large euro area dealers are borrowed from their customers, obviously, they get a better price, but not that much better, okay? So the spreads are like uh, um, ranges between one to three basis points in terms of the markup, if you like to use that word, and uh, in terms of lending, they also get a little better price. And if you go to the three months tenor, which is the typical tenor we look at, or the one month tenor, thinking about institutional investors hedging their uh, dollar exposure, Overall, the price dispersion in a cross-section remain fairly content um, between one to three basis points on average if you do like a volume weighted uh, calculations. So despite these large, large spikes that you saw in Bloomberg screen, um, this market is functioning. And in terms of price dispersion across participant types, it doesn't really strike to us as something uh, highly unusual. But then you might say, wait a minute, there are certain days that are very, very strange about these markets, and those are the quarter end days. Um, for most people in this audience, we know quarter ends are very special because in many um, uh, non-US jurisdictions, uh, the Basel III leverage ratio is assessed based on the quarter end balance sheets, and therefore uh, banks have strong incentives uh, to manage their quarter end balance sheet exposure and to cut down balance sheet intensive activities such as the matchbook repo, and that led to a big uh, dollar funding shortage, okay? And these shortages are showing up significantly in terms of the level of these spreads. So what we show here is if you take the GCF repo, which is more like the 95th percentile of our SOFR distribution, or 99th percentile of our SOFR distribution, minus the tripartite repo, uh, that matchbook repo spreads spikes by about 30 basis points, 
And if you look at GCF alone, relative to interest on reserve paid by the Fed, which doesn't spike on quarter end, GCF spikes about 50, uh, 40 basis points. But there are large, large spikes if you calculate the overnight FX swap implied funding rates. Uh, if you do it from the euro dollar markets, as shown here, on average, they spike about 150 basis points on an overnight basis. And if you do the dollar yen markets, they on average spike about 400 basis points. Um, so despite the fact that for the longest time post GFC, both the BOJ and the ECB here pay a negative interest on excess reserves, once you swap those negative uh, euro rates and negative yen rates back into US dollar terms, on quarter end, they're 150 basis and 400 basis point higher than the interest rate paid by the Fed, which never went negative. Um, so it's quite remarkable. Uh, so these price, if you just look at the surface, it, it hints like markets may not be functioning well. Liquidity might be highly dried up, like no one is transacting at these crazy prices, but is that really the case? So first, um, as confirmed by the strong intuition, the reason that we have these big spikes in funding rates on quarter end is that uh, non-US banks in particular contract their matchbook repo intermediation. It's been evident from this chart uh, where we're collecting the data, not uh, for all non-US banks, but for the selective non-US banks that file uh, daily reporting uh, to the Fed under the liquidity coverage ratio disclosure. What we have is that these non-US banks uh, contract their repo lending by about $60 billion. And in the meanwhile, they contract their repo borrowing by $80 billion. So on net, it looks as if they are on net lending more in repo, but there is a massive contraction in the gross book of repo borrowing and lending. And this additional net lending is finance via draining reserves on quarter end days. Okay, so, so there is enough evidence on the repo side. We know the cause and the reason for why we have a liquidity crunch. But the mystery part is what happens to the FX swaps. We know the prices are way higher than the repo spreads, but is there any transaction? And the short answer is yes, and there is even more transaction on quarter end dates. Uh, so this is again uh, demystifying the market using the MMSR data. And what you can see here is this is the event study style diagram uh, looking at, at the gross borrowing. So this is the MMSR bank's gross borrowing of dollar in the repo markets, oh, sorry, in the FX swap markets. Instead of going down, it actually went up uh, by about 60 billion if you look at the short term tenor. And the overall lending, very different from the repo transaction, the overall lending stayed pretty steady uh, throughout the quarter ends. On net, it looks like everybody on average is on net lending less dollars in the FX swap, but that's not because of a contraction lending, it's because of increase in borrowing. Okay, so this is a very interesting and to our surprise results without like, I guess the no hypothesis might be the other way around, but after looking at the results and just to do a quick recap, um, we know that the quarter end balance sheet constraint uh, contracts, I mean quarter end balance sheet capacity contracts significantly because of these regulatory reporting reasons. And instead of uh, having a very obsolete market, in fact, FX swap markets serves a very important function because euro area banks in particular, these money market, um, these MMSR uh, statistical reporting banks significantly increase their dollar borrowing in the FX swap markets. And in short, uh, this market acts as important residual markets uh, for the MMSR banks to borrow dollar funding on these very stressful days. And overall, there is actually higher FX swap volume that actually incurs the significant quarter term premium. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're doing good on time. Um, I will um, use the rest of the time before the Q&A to talk about the implications for financial stabilities. Um, so first, let's comment a little bit on the central bank uh, liquidity facilities. So when we look at these large, large spikes on quarter end here, it's just a recast of the same phenomena as shown in the green, which calculates the implied dollar funding rates. Here I'm switching to the dollar yen markets to make the point uh, even stronger because dollar yen tend to have a higher uh, cost when it comes to the dollar borrowing uh, compared to the euro dollar market. Um, so what you see here is this is the private implied dollar funding rates, uh, which spikes every quarter end. Uh, this is using the one week contract. So it spikes the last week within the quarter and stays high and only normalized after the quarter end. So it's not a one day phenomenon, it's a five business day phenomenon. Okay. And what is the red line? The red line is this um, 
dollar funding rate that banks can actually uh, borrow from the central bank swap line uh, at the BOJ. So what have we learned by looking at this chart um, in conjunction to these blue areas, which is the actual takeout uh, from the central bank swap lines, uh, summing up all these different uh, central banks take up. So what we have learned that it is pretty common, especially on these quarter end days, for the private money market rates, at least in the FX swap markets, uh, to exceed uh, the official rates uh, from the central bank uh, liquidity. But uh, there isn't always a take up, uh, except when we are in a crisis situation. So in other words, uh, to manage these quarter end spikes, we shouldn't really rely on the central bank swap length. Banks are not going to them. I mean, there is a tiny bit of take up, like maybe a couple of billion dollars, uh, but it's quite negligible, um, especially compared to the crisis take up. So, so those are not, uh, central bank liquidity swaps are not there to manage the quarter term premium. But instead, uh, if we have major market dysfunction in these short-term funding markets during the peak of GFC, during the peak of the European debt crisis, and during the peak of March 2020 COVID pandemic, uh, the swap line was actively drawn. Um, it was one of the largest liquidity facilities on the Fed balance sheet, and the swap line was quite effective in bringing down the dollar funding costs from the FX swap markets. Okay. Since the title of the talk is Repo and FX Swap, a tale of two markets, so far I've only talked about the FX Swap, you might be wondering, uh, how about the repo market? Uh, didn't we also have a facility uh, for the repo? And the answer is yes. Uh, so here I'm still plotting the swap line take up in blue, and I am plotting the repo facility take up, again, a facility, liquidity facility offered by the Federal Reserve in orange. Uh, what you see is that very interestingly, both uh, for the GFC period and also for the March 2020 period, the demand from a liquidity facility in the repo uh, happened a lot earlier. But once we recalibrated the FX swap facility parameters, so that boosted the massive increase in the take up in the FX swap, uh, there remained to be very little uh, interest in drawing additional liquidity from the repo market. So even in terms of uh, drawing central bank liquidity in stretch time, there seems to be important substitution going on. And there seems to be, um, at least with two data points suggesting, after massive take up in the FX swap market, uh, the unbalanced sheet cash market repo and the unshown unsecured markets uh, became normalized a lot more quickly. Okay, And uh, this is just to zoom in uh, the March 2020 episode where you see there was initially uh, increasing demand uh, from repo facility, but after we changed the uh, auction frequency for FX swaps from weekly to daily, so every day uh, the market participants can dot dollars in the FX swap markets, there, that boosted the demand for the FX swap significantly, and that also coincides with the dwindling demand from the repo facility. Okay, And uh, the next question that is on everybody's mind is, uh, how about normal time? How about now? And, uh, and uh, okay, so maybe before going there, let's do a recap of the crisis response first. Um, so, um, so, so my personal view uh, in terms of repo and FX swaps and which markets should we intervene, which market is more critical, obviously both markets are very important, but it's very, very important to remember, as we mentioned in the first slide, the global dollar funding markets are highly segmented. And the nice thing about the FX swap is it represents the most challenging segment of this very segmented dollar funding markets. A lot of market participants getting funding in the FX swaps do not have ready access to the repo, to the dollar unsecured market. And therefore, there is this hierarchy of money market rates where we have the FX swap being the highest rate when it comes to the dollar funding, followed by the unsecured term funding rates like CDECP, used to be LIBOR, now it's died. died and OIS and, and then repo and Fed funds uh, are typically the lowest rates. So, so the natural policy implication when it comes to crisis response is if somehow we can help bring down this highest rate down to normal, then all the other market follows through, right? If you fix the most hardest, the most challenging segments of the funding problem, then you don't have to worry as much uh, for the other segments. Um, and therefore, in my opinion, the central bank swap line is one of the most effective tools uh, when it comes to the crisis response. OK, now that was it for the crisis response. Uh, let's spend the last few minutes before the Q&A to talk about uh, the normal times. OK, 
So normal times, uh, thinking about now, we're in this second round of QT for the US. And the first round um, didn't end up uh, with a lot of, I guess, comforting news uh, when it comes to the functioning of the repo and FX swap markets. It ended with a ban. And that was September 16, 2019, that many people in this room distinctly remember. The green line, sorry, the blue line made into the headline of all the major newspapers, and that was the meltdown in the repo market. So the green line, the blue line plus the GC repo rates uh, in the morning of September 17th, uh, it reached to near 10%, uh, and the Fed immediately uh, launched the repo facility and uh, calmed the market afterwards. What perhaps didn't make into FT and Wall Street Journal are the red and the green lines. These are the implied dollar funding costs from the overnight euro dollar FX swap. Again, very much consistent with the overall theme of the talk. Uh, it's a market that's highly synergistic with repo market. Even though we think uh, for this particular episode, the pressure might ar ar be originating from the repo market, but the FX swap market pretty much on an intro day basis had a very similar uh, pressure. And it also rises in the afternoon of the 17th and peaked uh, in the morning of the 17th, okay? So, uh, as many people in this room uh, now agree, what was the problem back in September 2019 is that after two years of Fed balance sheet normalization or the previous round of QT, there was not enough reserve in the system. Even though the number was still pretty impressive, 1.4 trillion, but relative to the demand of the banking sector for, uh, for instance, their intraday liquidity needs, 1.4 trillion is not enough. Um, so what brings the natural question today, what is the right amount of level? Right? If you look at the charts, this is the blip that we were talking about. Uh, the reserve is showing red, right? I mean, in terms of the trend, it was like definitely shrinking, and then we hit the air pocket for both repo and FX swap markets. And this time around, um, the Fed has normalized this balance sheet more in terms of decline in security holdings. The reserve has staying overall relatively steady uh, because we have this extra stuff that we didn't have as much and that's the overnight reverse repo facility in terms of extra cash pile at the Fed, which was useful uh, in terms of the first area to dissipate uh, if the Fed continues to shrink its balance sheet. But the natural question is, uh, how far can we go? And another important factor to come in mind is not only there's a shrinking amount of cash balances uh, held in the commercial banks, there is oftentimes an increasing demand for repo during QT uh, at exactly the same time. Why is that? Because that helps, um, it helps to understand the mechanics of the rebalancing in the cash US Treasury market. So if the Fed is not holding the Treasury, and precisely during a rate hiking cycle, the yield curve of the Treasury market is highly inverted and negative, the real money investors uh, are not very interested in loading up longer dated duration at this time, then who has to pick up the gap between the supply and Fed now rolling over and the real money not willing to buy up, it has to be the intermediaries. Intermediary takes two forms, the primary dealers themselves in the treasury markets and levered investors, the hedge funds that rely on primary dealer balance sheets for repo funding in order to finance their treasury purchases. What we have seen is that during the September 2017, 20, sorry, during the 2017-2019, <sighs> Uh, QT cycle, the primary dealers increased their treasury holdings uh, by around uh, 150 basis, sorry, 150 billion dollars, and the levered investor, as proxied by their negative position in the treasury future market, increased their position by uh, slightly less. But this time so far, the primary dealers increased their positions uh, maybe a little less than 100 billion dollars. But there has been a massive take up uh, in the implied levered investors position. This is what this the Treasury cash future basis trade that made into the FD Wall Street Journal headline um, in recent weeks. Okay, so even though these are hedge fund positions, we think they still rely on dealer balance sheets because dealers are providing the repo financing for them. They're not taking the outright risk as in this case. Uh, when the rate volatility is high, dealers are more, more timid uh, taking on their own position, but they're still uh, giving large amount of balance sheet capacity to hedge funds uh, for them to finance their treasury purchases. Um, so, so the natural challenge is as we have an increasing demand for repo, if you want to keep doing a matchbook intermediation from a dealer perspective, you're gonna run into your balance sheet limit pretty quickly, 
So the workaround is instead of increase the size of balance sheet, doing more FX lending uh, in, in, in FX swaps or in repo markets, dealers have to drain reserves uh, to meet the demands from hedge funds to finance the basis trades. And uh, this is where the reserve, uh, the optimal reserve level becomes even more important uh, just to, um, in addition to accommodate this additional levered investor repo finance treasury demand. And finally, I will just conclude. And um, dollar funding market is highly global because of the global reserve currency status of the dollar. And the repo and FX swap markets are intimately connected. Hopefully after this uh, 40 minutes or so, um, we should reach the understanding that both markets are crucial to global financial stability. And uh, one important finding from this ongoing work with Jorg and Adrian using the MMSR data is that despite the seemingly dysfunctional no arbitrage violation, despite this large and persistent CIP deviation, the FX swap market is functional and serves the core function of providing dollar funding to the segments of the market which lacks access of direct funding, um, just at a higher cost. And uh, in stressful days, uh, this is a very, very important residual market uh, to backstop dollar liquidity. And finally, the resilience of both markets uh, highly depends on the intermediary balance sheet capacity ample amount of reserves and central bank liquidity backstops. And I will just conclude here and happy to take questions. Perfect. Many thanks, Wang Xin. Um, if you want, you can also okay. I'll come back. Have, have a drink while uh, we collect um, questions. Uh, are there any questions uh, here from the audience? Oh, sorry. Um, yes, please. And um, you'll get a microphone. Will Diamond from University of Pennsylvania. So, very interesting evidence you've shown connecting U.S. repo markets here and CIP deviations. I'm curious if you think there's a much stronger connection there between, say, frictions in a European or another country's repo market and what's going on internationally, or do you think if you saw stress in Europe, UK, uh, other developed countries, that this would also be reflected in? Uh, currency swap markets having frictions at the same time. Okay. Um, I, I see Christian has another question. Maybe we collect two or three and then... Sure. Uh, Christian Kubitzer from the ECB. Um, thanks a lot for the great keynote, uh, Wenxian. I was very surprised to see um, that euro area banks borrow, US dollar borrowing uh, sharply increases at quarter ends. We would have expected probably the, the reverse from, from the previous papers and that we know that CIP deviation also increases. So if the cost of, of dollar borrowing increases, why would euro area banks also increase their borrowing at quarter ends? Do you have um, a story in mind that explains this, why euro area banks need to increase their dollar funding um, using the most expensive source for that instead of increasing their repo funding or even the euro funding? Um, be very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Yes, uh, and one more question in the middle, please. Hi, Winchin. Um, I'm Shreya, for those people who don't know me. Um, I, well, my question is related to sponsor lending, because I think you had a bullet on that on your first slide. So I think a lot of the deviations we see, like at least the spikes in prices, is due to the fact that these rich cash dollar lenders can't lend to the intermediaries that want the dollar funding, right? So with sponsor lending, that's supposed to mitigate that friction, and then dealers are also able to net the repo on their balance sheet not have those balance sheet frictions you illustrated. So I was wondering if you guys had thought in this seemingly new paper about if sponsor lending is going to reduce some of these price spikes we see between these two markets. Okay, um, would you like to answer yeah. now? Yeah. Great, okay. um, not in any particular order. Uh, thanks, great, thanks so much for the great questions. Uh, going to the question uh, first, why do euro area banks increase their dollar borrowing in the FX swap market? Um, I should have spent a little more time. And the reason is uh, they cut back their cash market lending in the repo, cash, cash market borrowing in the repo market. Because repo is on balance sheet, uh, except the caveat that Shio was uh, mentioned. Uh, so if you think about most of the gross borrowing and lending of repo is on balance sheet on quarter end, you want to cut back your balance sheet uh, 
uh, footprint, uh, so you immediately cut back your repo borrowing by a large amount. Uh, so in order to fulfill part of that deficit, uh, you go to this other market, which is the FX swap. And if you're able, as a large dealer, to do um, gross borrowing and lending in FX swap at the same time, you net out your balance sheet exposure. So on quarter end in particular, the FX swap markets uh, from a European bank's perspective, if you already, especially if they already have euro on their balance sheets, uh, it's costless uh, to engineer that into US dollar. And so it's a more efficient way uh, to borrow dollars. Um, um, exception is on year end, uh, so we didn't uh, specify, uh, specifically mention the difference in the talk, uh, but what you see in the data is on year end, the pattern may not hold because as we briefly discussed, the GSIP surcharge actually has more to do with the FX swap, uh, so this relative balance sheet cost consideration doesn't necessarily apply to year ends. But for most of the quarter ends, um, yeah, it is a very efficient market uh, in terms of balance sheets for European banks to fulfill part of the deficits um, due to the contraction in the repo market borrowing. Okay, so, um, so on Shreel's question, uh, yes, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Um, so it is true that most of the gross borrowing and lending in repo markets stays on balance sheet. Uh, the exception in the US is if the repo is happening in a, on a sponsored platform. Um, so these are called sponsored repo. And um, you can think about that as being also centrally cleared. And uh, these are not uh, going to show up on balance sheets because the dealers are able to net out the borrowing and lending. Um, this has important implications because a lot of these plumbing issues is because we have a bottleneck in the intermediate balance sheet constraint. But if we can net out these very safe uh, market dealing type of transaction, that's going to alleviate that balance sheet constraint. So far, the, the segments of the sponsor repo in the overall uh, repo market remains to be a very small share um, for many different reasons. I mean, it is more costly. I mean, from these participation perspective, if you adhere all these uh, CCP rules, there's also an element uh, that so far only the overnight repos are allowed on the sponsor platform. Uh, so if you want to fund term, you cannot use the sponsor platform. But I do think uh, it is a possibility uh, for us to think about um, just economize uh, the balance sheet usage uh, to promote uh, more sponsor usage. Um, and finally, going back to Will's questions about uh, how about the other currencies. Um, so if you look at uh, the BIS over-the-counter derivative survey, about 95% of the FX forwards and swaps uh, have a US dollar linked legs. And the direction of CIP deviation often for most currencies vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, except for the Australian and New Zealand, tend to be in a way that it is more costly uh, for market participants to borrow a dollar in the FX swap markets compared to like say the dollar uh, cash markets, the repo and, uh, and, um, and CDCP or LIBOR. Um, so this suggests, I mean, this market uh, is very US dollar centric and people who do not have access to direct dollar funding would have access to their local currency funding and swap back into US dollar. Uh, so this is largely being primarily used as a market uh, to get US dollar funding, not the other way around, uh, with the exception of Australian and New Zealand dollar, where the deviation goes the other way around, which you can imagine a similar type of relative scarcity of the Aussie Kiwi dollar funding relative to US dollar funding. So we can imagine scenarios where, uh, in fact, some of the Australian banks fund in the US dollar markets and swap back into their local currency to meet their local currency funding demand. Perfect, many thanks. Um, just to remind those which are online um, that you can use the chat function in order to post questions. And we're monitoring the, uh, the, the chat and I can read out the questions if you have any. Um, other than that, I would also, um, yes, Arancha. So, so, sorry, Zarancha. Do you have any views on um, the rule to mandate uh, central clearing for treasuries? Basically, there's a debate around that and what it means for the overall size, you know, for the repo market, the pricing. I mean, there's a lot of debate whether that would take leverage down the system. I mean, what's your thoughts around that? Yeah, so, so it's, it's somewhat related to the sponsor repo question. So, my personal view is central clearing the repo market seems to be more first order than central clearing the cash treasury. But one can argue perhaps these two things are quite related. It's hard to do one without the other. Um, and the reason is, right, I mean, if you look at uh, 
dealer balance sheet, it's the gross repo that's basically crowding out their total balance sheet usage. It's not their outright treasury holdings, right? I mean, they are uh, treasury primary dealers, but they don't really hold much of an outright position. We're talking about $100, $200 billion, considered large for the entire collection of primary dealers, where for repo, we're talking about more than a trillion dollar. So if you can net out that a trillion dollar is going to be a lot more uh, efficient in terms of compressing the balance sheet. Any further questions in the room? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Do you, I mean, Wenxin, as you spoke very well, um, both the FX swap plan as well as other interventions on the intermediary balance sheets yeah. will make this market work better, compress things, provide lender losses are in different ways. But could I get you to speculate a little more about whether we should worry about moral hazard, especially as we think about the development of these markets and how they, if governments intervene or central banks intervene, to what extent are we shrinking the ability of these markets to intermediate or not? Meaning, if we're, if we're very aggressive in doing so, are we destroying the markets? And somewhat linking also to our discussion this morning with the first paper of the extent to which we are leading to collateral scarcity, but just generally scarcity in the ability of markets to intermediate this? Or do you see it as a really a one-way? You kind of, in your talk was very much of a one-way. It seems like the intervention is going to be positive. But if you could think a little bit, if you could speak out loud a little bit about the, some counters of moral hazard, I would find that useful. Great. And then that testing has a question. Oh, yeah. From the yield spread between the FX swap cost and the repo cost at the end of the quarter, what is the implied perceived cost of equity capital? And we have a third question, maybe, over there. Um, thanks, Matthias Drehman. I have a question. You, you linked the, the developments to the steady state size of the balance sheets, indicating that you know, there's a link between leverage investors. But obviously, or, you know, there's a lot of talk there's too many leverage investors. So should we encourage it? And that's one question. The second question, is this a steady state, you know, should we think about it in the steady state, or is it relative, only mattering when we change the, you know, you show these charts where QT, so it's the change rather than the level. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for another round of terrific questions. Um, maybe do it in the reverse order, because the third question is also somewhat related to the moral hazard question. Um, so. So what we have shown you is that there is a strong negative relationship in the data between the slope of the yield curve and these levered investors' positions, either measured from primary dealers' own outright position and, or from these implied levered investors running a relative value trades, basically going long cash treasuries and hedging out the duration risk uh, using treasury futures. Um, so, um, so it's particularly pronounced uh, during the tightening cycle when you have a lot of movements in the slope of yield curve, uh, which is basically what we have. And on top of that, you have the Federal Reserve not rolling over its existing holdings and the overall uh, holdings of the Fed Treasury holdings had declined, I think, more than $800 billion. Um, so so I, I, I view this as a particularly important phenomenon uh, for the current stage. If you think about long run steady state, someone has to absorb that duration and it's not the levered investor, it is not the primary dealers. They're not in a job to hold those duration on a steady state. We should instead have the long-term institutional investors, the pension insurance in particular, to absorb more duration. But in order to incentivize the real money, uh, there has to be a correction in the term premium. I guess in recent weeks, we've seen a modest rise in the term premium, sort of going on in the right direction. You can also think about the, the size of dealer balance sheets or balance sheet capacity uh, is a function of the speed of adjustments. Um, basically, if dealers are not able to accommodate more leverage demand from the basis trades or themselves not being willing to increase their outright holdings more, then the market pricing for the term premium needs to be adjusted more quickly to really attract the real monies uh, to fill the vacuum. Okay, so going back to the moral hazard questions, like whether we should like make these markets as efficiently as possible uh, to discourage, I guess, leverage and risk taking. Uh, it's a great question. I think the answer is nuanced. Um, so one way to think about it is uh, like all these spreads, like either in terms of the GCF tri-party repo spreads or in terms of the CIP deviations, 
our form of insurance premium that we're paying just to ensure that the whole system is not overly leveraged because our struggle is not be able to really uh, exactly monitor and pinpoint the level of risk taking. And instead we have a more blunt tool, uh, which is essentially the Basel three leverage ratio, saying that nobody can be leveraged uh, even if you're holding reserves uh, more than X amount. Um, so, so that is one way uh, to, to perhaps prevent moral hazard and over excessive leverage taking. But from an economist perspective, this is always a little dissatisfying because we're not really a penalty, a making penalty of activities based on the risk. Um, so another argument is to think perhaps the way that we are regulating the system by imposing these very bland total leverage constraint is creating some distortion. Perhaps we don't have to compromise as much of financial uh, resilience if we were to increase the risk weighted capital regulation, but relaxing some of this leverage ratio. So overall, we have a little less debt we cost, debt we lost. Uh, the whole system runs a little more smoother when it comes to these risk free money dealing activities. Uh, but when it comes to the actual risk taking, uh, we have to be a bit more strict. Um, so, so I sort of see benefits in both type of arguments. Um, going back to Annette's question on the cost of capital, uh, typically the bank, the back of envelope calculation is if you think about uh, the expected return on capital is like 10% and with like a 3% Basel three leverage for the continental European banks, we're talking about 30 basis points opportunity cost of putting on something that's balance sheet intensive, that's largely in line with the overall size of the CIP deviation. So the back of envelope works out. Um, but on quarter end, obviously these things go up much higher, uh, but, but it's only like four days a year. And, uh, and I think the Basel committee is actually encouraging more jurisdiction to move into a daily average regime, like the UK has done that many years ago. Uh, so, so perhaps like it's not as relevant for banks to think about raising a costly equity just to cover those days. Perfect, many thanks. So we do have um, two questions from our, our audience um, online. Um, one is from Jens uh, Peterson, and I think it's very much related. Um, how would it change in the calculation of the US um, GSIP surcharge from year end to an average over the year change the year end spike in funding rates? And then the second question is from Dimitris Stefanidis, um, who um, would like to thank you for your presentation and from experience the pickup in US dollar premium paid for US dollar funding via FX swaps has become smaller. Um, the uh, years gone by from 2017 to 2022. Um, is there a reason behind this? Yeah, great. Um, also doing it in the reverse order, like so why is the FX swap basis uh, become smaller? Like we talk about the supply side constraints from dealer balance sheet, there's also demand sector, demand demand side factor, right? Think about, um, we talk about levered investors, these relative value hedge funds need repo financing to finance their treasury holdings. Uh, the parallel of that is the non-US based institutional investors essentially funding their dollar purchases using FX swaps. They don't use the word funding, they use the word hedging. Think about the Japanese life insurance companies uh, holding large chunk of US treasuries and corporate bonds uh, maintain a hedge ratio on average which is reported around 50% and that is a lot of hedging or short term funding demand if you like and that's coming from FX swaps. So, Again, very similarly to the lack of incentives uh, to invest in longer dated duration when the curve is very inverted or flat, for the FX hedged investors, if you think about earning the long-term yield and paying the short rate as the funding rate, when the curve is quite inverted, the demand is quite lukewarm. Uh, so one way to rationalize the, the relative unremarkable trends of FX swaps in recent days, uh, recent year, is that the curve is just not attractive for the FX hedged investors uh, to come into this market, which dampens the demands and therefore um, uh, mitigates some of the basis. Um, okay, so going back to the GSIP surcharge, if we were to move uh, to a more daily averaging or like even months and calculation of the surcharge score, this relative uh, dynamics that we have seen that the European banks uh, basically 
switched out from the repo funding into FX swap market funding, that pattern may not hold uh, because if you add an additional kick, especially for the largest, most important banks, and the way that the GSIP is calculated is, is highly nonlinear, you really don't want to go to the next bucket. Um, so there could be a lot more uh, frictions um, to make the FX swap markets like um, a reliable markets uh, to get residual funding on the quarter turn as well. Perfect. Many thanks, Wing Xi, for this uh, inspiring uh, speech and for your um, great answers to all these questions. Many thanks. Great. Thank you.